Hey guys, I hope you guys are doing really well at the start of this week. This is me just hopping on and I will not give you any kind of time limit for this because I'll be honest and say some of you I know will be more interested in hearing this than others, but this is what I promised you I would deliver and that I'm going to post this video strictly to review the two assignments from week two. So during this video, I'm going to go over the right answers to the On Weasel's Night Poem assignment and to go over the right answers for the no news from Auschwitz and the butterfly poem. So like I said, I know some of you will be a little more interested in this than others, and I really don't even know. I'm gonna make sure I give you more of a complete um, review than trying to keep it to a time, so I'm really not even positive how long this will be. I'll try to be short and sweet, but if you're interested in why you maybe got some points off from the assignment this week, I'm gonna go over that and the right answers right now. Okay, so I'm gonna start kind of going in order with the On Weasel's Night Poem. So this poem was the fairly short poem that came then with your three multiple choice questions. Number four was asking about irony. Number five was the question in reference to the word stench. And number six um, was kind of more of like a creative writing activity. So going over this from the beginning, number one said, imagery can best be described as language that. So in order to best understand this, guys, you kind of had to go back to what you remember of imagery and what imagery is supposed to do for us in an English setting. And imagery is Google definition defined as the visual, descriptive, or figurative language we use in our writing. So if it's supposed to be visually descriptive, meaning I am going to paint you a picture with my words, the correct answer to this is C. And C of this was that it appeals to the senses. Many of you chose B, which is to emphasize the abstract. So an abstract is a thought or idea. So some of you thought that imagery was really for emphasis which is, I can definitely see your thought process there, but the better answer and the more strategic answer of the use of imagery is that it's supposed to appeal to our senses. Meaning, if I'm reading something, I want to close my eyes as I'm reading it and be able to visually see it. So that is one of our senses. Or if you're trying to write to me some kind of description of the food you're eating while in quarantine. I want to be able to close my eyes and taste it. That's the senses. Okay. So number one was C, that it appeals to the senses. Number two, the best example of imagery is D. So many of you were really, really close on number two, that you either said B or C. And the correct answer is D, that it is both. So the two best examples of imagery are B, like bombs on sleeping towns, because I think we can all agree that we can physically see that image in our heads, just like any other movie we've seen where there's been some kind of explosive and what it does, that that would be descriptive in our heads, that that would give us that vision, that visual. And then C says the stench rises from the page. Again, that is very descriptive to me. I can visually see something that smells so awful that it is like lingering in the air. You know, think of something that smells that bad and how it just kind of lingers in the air. And that's what that's describing, that it really hits you in your senses. So the number two answer was D, both of those, B and C. Number three says, it gives you a quote from the poem. I drop copies on their desks like bombs on sleeping towns and let them read. For number three, I will be honest and say, thank goodness most of you got this right. But guys, it was D. That's an example of a simile. You would not believe, unfortunately, how many of you said A, a metaphor. Guys, that goes all the way back to sixth grade or before. Similes include like or as. So take your time, guys. This is stuff I know that you know, and maybe we're just rushing here, that it's a simile, not a metaphor, okay? 
Number four was hands down though, guys, the most missed question. And that goes back to irony. Irony is tricky because a lot of times we think we understand it and then it just is kind of way off. So I'm gonna try to spend the most time on this one here. So for number four, you were supposed to pick two examples of irony from the poem. Okay, so again, if you just quick Google search what irony means, a quick definition of irony, it is the language that normally signifies the opposite of something. So remember in class, I would say it's not something you would expect them to say based on that situation or based on that person. So if you guys remember when I introduced this poem, I said it was written by a teacher. So the number one piece of irony that you guys should have noticed is the line where he comes out and says, I cannot teach this book. Obviously we know that's ironic because he's a teacher and that's the exact opposite of what he's planning on doing. He is saying, I cannot teach this book when we both know he has every intention of teaching this book and is probably even going so far as to use the poem that he wrote to help teach the book. So that's irony, that's one example. That's the opposite of what we would normally expect, okay? The second example of irony, that's the correct answer, because you guys gave me many, some of you had one, but maybe not the other. So the second correct, there's only two examples of correct irony in this, is the quote, nothing is destroyed, okay? He says, nothing is destroyed. We know that is irony because so clearly when we reflect on the Holocaust and what we know of not just the Holocaust, but all of World War II, obviously there was mass destruction and that not just, you know, physical destruction, but emotional, mental, you name it. So to say nothing is destroyed, we know obviously the exact opposite of that is true. So that's irony. Okay. So those are your two examples for number four, irony. Number five says, in the context of this poem, stench means what? Some of you got a little bit too metaphorical on this. It really was not supposed to be too deep. I was just having you reflect on what that word means. And in that uh, sentence, it was just referencing the fact that it was the stench of just that aroma of a camp and the aromas that he describes in the novel night as you continue reading. And it's a gross smell. That's what a stench is. And that's all he was referencing was that smell that lingers. So some of you got a little bit too deep on that, which is okay. I understand that sometimes happens where you think I'm almost asking too much of you. But for number five, you're really just to tell, supposed to tell me what stench meant in the context of that poem. And it was just a gross smell, okay? And then for number six, all of you got this right. It just said to list at least six key words that you feel contribute to the main idea of this poem. And you know, many of you were right on the target with death, cries, burning, chokes, scarring. So some of those, you know, most of you picked very similar words. So I think you got the gist of that. Guys, On Weasel's Night poem was worth 30 points total. There were six questions, so simple math, that was five points each. So normally I would grade that completely on accuracy, five points each. Since we're not physically together where you could ask me questions as we go through this, I was a little bit easier on you here. So I only took five points off total if you were missing a question entirely. So if you forgot to answer one and just I didn't see an answer, that's when I took off five points. Otherwise, if you missed an answer, I took off two or three points depending on what you gave me. And then for number four with the irony, I took off just one point depending on how many of those you got right. So if you have a question about your points, again, reach out to me individually, but hopefully this helps you just get a good idea that I only took partial points. I didn't do the full five points off if you missed one. Guys, take your time through these assignments. I think many of you rushed this, unfortunately, because th these were not difficult questions. And I know you guys would know these if you just kind of take your time and go through it slowly. And some of these were very simple errors that I saw. Okay. All right. Moving on to the next one here. This is your next task was to read the no news from Auschwitz news article and then the butterfly poem. Okay. So the first thing that you guys had to do was give me three examples of objective or factual writing and then three examples of subjective or opinionated and emotional writing. Guys, most of you did a phenomenal job with this. You got it. Well done. 
I think you are pretty confident in that, hopefully. If someone were to say that's subjective or objective, hopefully you now will recall this assignment and remember what that is. Um, the only reason that points would have been taken off for this part is if some of you accidentally just gave me two instead of three, because you're supposed to have three examples of each. So some of you are maybe just missing examples, okay? Number three, because that was one and two. So then number three on the back here said, what is ironic about the title of this report by Rosenthal? That's the author. So guys, as always, you know, my questions can be loaded sometimes. There are three potential answers to this question. So I'm going to quickly hit on all three. Okay. So the first, and this is what I saw the most of, and this is hopefully the most obvious to you. Again, remember, irony is the opposite of what we would expect. So the first piece of irony here is that in the title, it says no news, when in all actuality, this is a news report. It is published, it is a news article that was published in the New York Times back at the beginning of the 90s, and this is very much a news report. So that is irony in itself, that the title of this piece says no news, and it is literally a news article published in the New York Times. So that's number one. Number two is that when you first read this title, No News from Auschwitz, I'm sure some of you were kind of off put by it. And you should be because it's kind of almost insulting, right? Um, but when you really think about it, and once you read the article, it's actually true. And that's not what we would expect. That's irony. Because there really is nothing new happening at Auschwitz currently. You know, as it is now, it's they're practically calling it a grave site, right? And a grounds for memorial and where they can just come and pay their respects. And then, yes, they might have kind of a museum component, but for the most part, anything big that has happened at Auschwitz happened long ago. And there really is nothing brand new, thankfully, happening at Auschwitz and that we would not expect that news article to be true, but it kind of is that the title is ironically true. And so that's the second piece of irony that there really is nothing new happening and we wouldn't necessarily anticipate that. Okay. And then last but not least, this kind of is a piggyback, I guess, to number two, but to say that there's no news from Auschwitz, obviously we know that enough has happened there in the past right? That it's almost insulting to say there's nothing new because plenty has happened, that there has been plenty of news in the past with Auschwitz as the title. But the key here is that new part. So really, it's just kind of two examples of irony. And then I kind of piggybacked those last two. All right. So now transitioning into the butterfly poem here. What relationship do you see between the news report and this poem? Y'all, for love of all that is holy. I was so hoping I did not read as many responses as I did that just said they both have to do with the Holocaust. Of course, they both have to do with the Holocaust. Deeper layer here, folks. What relationship do you see between the news report and this poem outside of the fact that they both are pertaining to the Holocaust? Very specifically, guys, they are both surrounding the death camp of Auschwitz. One is obviously written about it and one is was written in there. And so that kind of gives us a dual perspective. And some of you did say that, which is awesome, giving us kind of that double perspective of, you know, outsider visitor looking into Auschwitz versus the person that endured Auschwitz. So that was one comparison that they were similar. The second is that they both pertain, contain, excuse me, they both contain really predominant elements of nature. So obviously the butterfly element of nature. But in addition, you guys notice, and in fact, many of your subjective pieces of writing that you wrote down were in reference to some of the nature descriptions, kind of referencing how you wouldn't expect it to be sunny. You wouldn't expect it to, you know, be a normal um, kind of environmental setting um, that you would expect it to always kind of be rainy or just dreary. And so many of you were pretty spot on with including nature, that it both kind of um, had elements of nature. So then number five was to identify three poetic elements you recognized in the poem. I got to take my packet out of my little sleeve here. Um, number one mistake I saw here, guys, 
if I'm asking you to identify poetic elements, it means very specifically identify the elements. Some of you just came right out and said imagery, alliteration, and personification. Guys, I could have just written those down without even really looking at the poem. So you've got to be specific here. If you did not include the example from the poem, how does that tell me as I'm grading, especially virtually, that you understand what these concepts are? So you guys have got to be as detailed as possible with your responses. And to be very frank, some of you just gave me the absolute bare minimum with these responses. And you guys know exactly what I would say. That's not honors or pre-AP material. And I know that this is new, and I know that this is weird, but guys, you're still really advanced students, okay? And some of you just, I know, can give me more than what you gave me on this. So I'm gonna go through, I've got my poem with all my chicken scratch on it, and I'm just gonna go through the poem stanza by stanza and give you the ones from each stanza. Most of you that gave me you know, an example correctly with the example of the poetic element that it is, got great credit and we're spot on. So the first stanza says, the last, the very last, so richly, brightly, dazzlingly yellow, perhaps if the sun's tears would sing against a white stone. So the last, the very last is an example of repetition. The second line, so richly, brightly, dazzlingly yellow, guys, that's imagery. You should see the most obnoxious, like highlighter yellow when you say that shade out loud. And then perhaps if the sun's tears would sing, this is an example many of you gave me, that is personification. Obviously personifying the sun and giving it tears. Next stanza says, such, such a yellow is carried lightly way up high. It went away, I'm sure, because it wished to kiss the world goodbye. Again, such, such a yellow is another example of repetition. And then it went away, I'm sure, because it wished to kiss the world goodbye. Kiss the world goodbye is another example of personification. And many of you gave me that one correctly in the example, which is good. For seven weeks, I've lived in here, penned up inside this ghetto, but I have found my people here. The dandelions call to me and the white chestnut candles in the court. Only I never saw another butterfly. So the dandelions call to me is another example of personification. Again, many of you got that one spot on. Chestnut candles in the court. I was really proud of some of you that got this. This is alliteration, that common C sound. So very good there. Last stanza, that butterfly was the last one. Butterflies don't live in here in the ghetto. So that butterfly was the last one. I want you to think about that statement because that line is an example of a poetic element. And I would, if we were in class right now, I would wait like an awkward three minutes until somebody got this because I know it would hit you eventually. That butterfly was the last one. Guys, that's a hyperbole. That's an exaggeration. Was that literally the last butterfly that ever existed? No. But obviously, now kind of going to the entire scope of the poem, and many of you jotted this down, the butterfly is a symbol. The butterfly is a metaphor and a representation of something far bigger than just a butterfly. So in this poem, the butterfly is supposed to resemble freedom, right? So if he's referencing the butterfly as being the last one, he's saying that their freedom was gone. They had lost their freedom. So that is a hyperbole at the end. And then overall, the butterfly equates to freedom. Now, last thing, last little tidbit here, is the color of the butterfly. This is important. So richly, brightly, dazzlingly yellow. Guys, what color does yellow represent in our society today when we think of yellow? And I want you to think of the really, I know, cheesy example, and you guys know, of course, I've watched it with Lena since we've been out. Inside Out, the movie with all the emotions. What color is joy? She's yellow, guys, that was done so purposefully. Yellow is supposed to represent joy and happiness. So it's even more significant that he's saying that butterfly was gone because he's saying the last remnants of hope, freedom, joy, and happiness were gone. So it's so much bigger than just the butterfly and the nature, obviously. Hopefully you see that there. So that is that, guys. That is all I have for you. Hopefully that answers some questions. Gosh, I miss doing this with you guys in person. It's just not the same. Um, 
But if you have any questions for me, kind of that I didn't cover, just reach out, okay? And I'm happy to help explain anything more from there. But hopefully this guy gives you a good start here of understanding why you maybe missed some questions or some points as you go. All right, I'll talk to you soon, guys. Bye.